The last speaker of our formal program of this symposium is Barbara Galati, the Curator Emerita of American Art at the Brooklyn Museum, where she organized numerous exhibitions, including William Merritt Chase, Modern American Landscapes, and Great Expectations, John Singer Sargent Painting Children. Her curatorial projects for the New York Historical Society were Making American Taste, a Narrative Amer uh, Art for a New Democracy, and Beauty's Legacy, Gilded Age Portraits in America. And that was in 2013. For that exhibition, she was the volume editor and the principal author of the accompanying catalog. Most recently, Barbara has contributed essays to the catalogs Une Brève Histoire de l'Avenir for the Louvre, Sargent Portraits of Artists and Friends for the National Portrait Gallery of London in 2015, and Venedig Stadt und Kunstler for the Kunstforum in Hamburg. She lives in Bristol, England. We're happy she made the trip over here to join us. And happily, uh, she will talk to us now about Samuel Untermeyer, the man who brought Whistler's falling rocket that's on your program, a fitting conclusion. Well, I'll say my thank you today, too, to Inga, to Samantha, to Linda for putting me on the roster of speakers, and to the Frick in general for this wonderful symposium. Um, Sam Samuel Untermeyer, the man who bought Whistler's Falling Rocket, he remains somewhat of a mystery to me because information about his collecting is somewhat elusive. I'm showing you a photograph of him uh, just to give you a sense of the strong personality and presence this man had. <laughs> um, Untermeyer is undoubtedly best remembered as an influential New York attorney who left his mark on early 20th century economic, political, and legislative affairs in the United States. With the exception of the Samuel Untermeyer Park and Gardens, what remains of his grand Yonkers New York estate, there is little to give hint to the extent of his passion for collecting art apart from the 1940 catalog that accompanied the Park Burnett Gallery's auction of portions of his estate. Untermeyer's activity as a collector did not come to my attention until I worked on the exhibition Beauty's Legacy for the New York Historical Society. The project included Untermeyer's 1901, do I have the right, no, I have number two here. Okay, I have, no, I found number one, okay. It's <laughs> okay. Um, uh, the painting that Linda Ferber showed you yesterday, uh, the 1901 portrait of Untermeyer by Anders Zorn. And uh, Zorn, the Swedish portrait specialist, was over here in the United States quite frequently, and he was painting the movers and shakers of the uh, industrial uh, complex, um, including Charles Deering. Um, he was very close friends with the gardeners. So um, I think you can understand why someone like Untermeyer would also want to have his portrait painted by the same famous artist. Uh, the, um, in the course of researching uh, Untermeyer's biography, I learned that it was he who purchased James McNeil Whistler's famed Nocturne in Black and Gold. Oops. It should be on there. The Falling Rocket. Well, if it's not, we'll see it later. Um, it, that's now in the Detroit Institute of Arts. Uh, he purchased it directly from Whistler in 1892. In turn, this fact inspired me to investigate Untermeyer's previously unexplored role as a collector of paintings, furnishings, sculpture, and other items of artistic value. Um, the talk today is only devoted to the paintings. Untermeyer was born in Lynchburg, Virginia in 1858 to parents who were part of an extensive and close-knit community of German Jews, many of whom were originally from the same Bavarian village of Herben. His mother, the former Therese Landauer, had married Salomon Guggenheimer in 1847. Their son, Randolph, was born in July 1848, and Salomon died the following October. Therese remarried in 1850, this time to another Bavarian expatriate, Isidore Untermeyer. 
Distantly related to both Therese and to Salomon Guggenheimer, Isidore was unfortunate in his business ventures as a dry goods salesman or merchant and was bankrupt at the time of his death in 1866. Therese, however, reportedly had a sizable amount of her own money, and soon after her second husband died, she moved with her five children by him to New York City, where they joined her eldest son, Randolph, who had been st studying in uh, New York, training as a lawyer, and stuck up here in the North during the Civil War. Um, his three half-brothers, Isaac, Samuel, and Morris, also trained as lawyers, and they graduated from Columbia Law in 1874, 1878, that was Samuel's graduation date, and 1882, respectively. All three joined Randolph's practice after passing the bar. In 1888, Untermeyer married Minnie Carl, a daughter of Protestant German emigres, Manlius and Pauline Karl, who had fled Germany with Karl Schurz in 1848. And this is a portrait by my dissertation topic, James Jabusa Shannon, that is now in the collection of the Hudson River Museum in Yonkers. Um, it was painted in 1906 and shown at the Royal Academy, along with an unlocated portrait by Shannon of the Untermeyer's daughter, Irene. The first of the three children was born in 1882 to the Untermeyers, and in 1883, the ambitious Samuel entered into partnership with his half-brother Randolph, forming Guggenheimer and Untermeyer. Throughout its subsequent iterations, the firm acquired a long and distinguished history, owing in large part to the brilliance of Samuel, who was usually credited with with uh, shifting the client list from one dominated by relatively small German Jewish accounts to a Wall Street powerhouse boasting a corporate clientele of national stature. Samuel himself achieved national press coverage throughout his career, perhaps most famously for his hand in the formation of Bethlehem Steel, Steel Corporation in 1905 and his role as counsel of a subcommittee of the U.S. House of Representatives on Banking and Currency during the Pujo Money Trust investigation. He was a determined trust buster. By 1922, Samuel Untermeyer's personal wealth was estimated to be $50 million. By most reports, Untermeyer was highly competitive in his private and professional lives. To enhance his social standing, he took on the persona of a Southern gentleman. He was a Southerner, and according to the historian Richard Hawkins, he, quote, reinvented his merchant father as a tobacco planter and a Confederate officer. Um, uh, there's also a family story that, that says that uh, his Isidore, his father, was so devoted to the Confederacy that he dropped dead of a heart attack when he heard that Lee had surrendered. Um, Anyway, Untermeyer was especially keen uh, to rival his, or to best his rivals, one of whom was J.P. Morgan. Once he learned that Morgan was a successful breeder of collies, Untermeyer followed suit and gained a reputation for raising champion collies. Um, and here I'm just showing you two uh, clippings from newspapers that show you the types of publicity that Untermeyer was receiving at the turn of the century, uh, one for his colleagues, but one for his, his, uh, his professional persona as well. And if you want to check the archive index for the New York Times, between 1890 and 1940, when he died, there are at least 3,000 mentions of Samuel Untermeyer alone in the Times. Um, it is likely that Untermeyer's competitive nature fueled his energy in his mission to acquire art, inasmuch as many of his business and social contacts were doing the same thing. It's difficult to pinpoint the moment that Untermeyer turned to art collecting. Moreover, it remains open to question as to the extent he had gauged advisors to guide him in his acquisitions. 
What can be said, however, is that he appears to have seriously and rather furiously become, began acquiring art in February 1891 with the purchase of at least nine works at the American Art Association's auction of important modern paintings from the collection of George I. Saini, among them Giovanni Boldini's um, In the Garden of Versailles, bought for $1,050, and William Merritt Chase's In the Park, bought for $475. Note the discrepancy in prices. Um, the Baldini, the last I knew, was on the art market in London, and the Chase is now in the Thyssen collection in Madrid. Um, Untermeyer's other purchases were also a mix of European and American works. There were two by Constant Troyon, one each by Francois Grison, Alexander Helwig Wyant, George Innes, Joseph Israels, and Eduardo Zamasua. Although it might be said that this diverse array of American and European paintings sig sing signaled Untermeyer's eclectic or perhaps unschooled taste, it must be pointed out that the variety witnessed here reflects the composition, as we have seen on, over the last few days, of many Gilded Age collections formed in the United States. To be sure, if we care to venture that this group reveals Untermeyer as a novice collector without direction, then it follows that we might also suppose that he found validation in the fact that his purchases came with the imprimatur of the Saini collection. Now, I need some water. <laughs> In 1892, Untermeyer established himself as a bona fide collector with the purchase of Whistler's Falling Rocket. There it is. On this occasion, he is known to have sought the advice of the British artist Sidney Starr, uh, whose dates are 1857 to 1925. Uh, Starr was a staunch Whistler acolyte who had expatriated to New York around 1891. And here, just to have an idea of what Starr's work looked like at that time, uh, this is Study in Blue and Gray, 1891, which is now in Tate Britain's collection. And I'll go back to the, the Whistler now. Untermeyer may have seen Falling Rocket in New York in March 1889 when it was included in Herman Wunderlich's exhibition of 62 oils, pastels, and drawings by Whistler. What is more, he may have been impressed by the fact that such enlightened connoisseurs as Charles Lang Freer and H.O. Havemeyer uh, bought from the show. Then too, Untermeyer, who traveled frequently, may have seen the painting in London when it was displayed at the Goupil Gallery in March 1892. In any case, the flood of publicity accorded Whistler at this time was sure to have come to the collector's attention. Being a lawyer, he may even have had been attracted to the painting because of Whistler's celebrated lawsuit against Ruskin. On September 2nd, 1892, Starr wrote to Whistler in Paris, informing him that Untermeyer requested the delivery of Falling Rocket, Falling Rocket to his home at 675 Fifth Avenue. Now, that's near the corner of 53rd. Starr went on to say that Untermeyer had appreciated Starr's advice about the aesthetic value of the painting, although the lawyer had initially balked at the steep asking price of 800 guineas. Now, I'm sorry I can't translate that into dollars right now, but it was a lot of money. In the end, as Starr emphasized to Whistler, Untermeyer acquiesced once Starr had argued the case for the price. Untermeyer wrote to Whistler acknowledging receipt of the painting on November 7th that year, adding that he and his wife were, quote, enchanted with the painting. Untermeyer further confessed, quote, I had but little previous acquaintance with your paintings, never having had the good fortune to see many of them. I, congratu I congratulate you upon the marvelous strength and originality of your great genius, and I'm proud to know that an American artist has secured a permanent place in the front rank of the great painters of modern times. Now that's key. He's proud that it's an American artist in the front ranks. 
Throughout the following decades, Untermeyer was a generous lender of this and other works from his collection. He had agreed to Whistler's request to lend it to the World's Columbian Expo Exposition, but for reasons unknown, the loan did not come to pass. It is impossible to track the pattern of Untermeyer's buying in complete detail. But it is documented that he continued to bid at sales of well-known collections. For instance, he bought Mariano Fortuny's for farmhouse courtyard at Alhambra, 1873, now in the Harvard Art Museum's Fog uh, Museum, and Constant Troyon's Valley of the Took from, from the Wil William Hood Stewart sale in 1898. The Paris-based Stewart the father of Julius Stewart, the artist, had gained distinction for his collection of contemporary European art and was acknowledged as the man who had made Fortuny's reputation in the United States. Untermeyer's collection was said to have reflected Stewart's influence, an opinion encouraged by the fact that his acquisitions included works by Zamasua Baldini and Fortuny and other then fashionable European painters. This observation, however, seems flimsy in light of the reality that other American collectors also sought works by the same artists, including W.H. Vanderbilt and Robert Livingston Cutting. From the 1899 sale of Thomas B. Clark's collection of un uh, collection, Untermeyer secured Homer's The West Wind, 1891, now in the Addison Gallery of American Art. At least he was a living American artist, <laughs> so he had no fears of a forgery in this case. Um, and he also um, uh, purchased Homer Dodge Martin's Adirondack Scenery, now in a private collection. And unfortunately, I could not find a decent image of it. So that's uh, it up there in the upper left-hand corner. Um, oddly enough, this painting uh, by Martin, the Adirondack scenery, um, made headlines for commanding, quote, the largest price ever secured by an American landscape painting of its size at auction. A lot of qualifiers there. But um, Untermeyer bought it for $5,500. From the 1900 sale of the William T. Evans collection, Untermeyer acquired another work by Martin. Oh, sorry. Creek Book Creek Biff Church uh, from 1893, now in uh, LA County Museum of Art. In 1899, Untermeyer purchased a large estate in Yonkers called Greystone. It was demolished in 1948, so don't go looking for it. Um, the remains uh, of the property purchased uh, are now the Samuel Untermeyer Park and Gardens. The property consisted of this palatial mansion of approximately 99 rooms on a tract of land of 40, 145 acres. Its acquisition fed Untermeyer's substantial appetite for headlines and signaled his continuing pursuit of upward social mobility among the dominant Protestant elite. Designed by John Davis Hatch, Greystone was originally built for the hat manufacturer John Waring, who sold it in 1879 to Samuel J. Tilden, a former New York State governor and failed presidential candidate. The Untermeyers, Samuel and Minnie, transformed Greystone into a show place featuring magnificent gardens that attested to Samuel's passion for horticulture and also accommodated Minnie's love for hosting grand gatherings dedicated to poetry and music. The property added to Untermeyer's growing fame. Society columns noted the private and public events there. And uh, one year, 30,000 people visited the gardens in one day. Throughout the decade of the 1890s, not 1890s, Untermeyer's collection grew as he added more works by such American painters as Alexander Harrison, William Keith, Robert Minor, Julian Ricks, and George Boughton. Unfortunately, I have not been able to find these works yet. So uh, this, this is an ongoing research project for me. 
The New York galleries of William Shouse and Edward Brandis figure in the provenances of several acquisitions. For instance, Jean-Léon Jérôme's The Two Augers from 1861 in a private collection uh, that came through Shouse. The New York Gallery of Durand Ruel uh, was the source of uh, Eugène Frometon's The Falconer up there on the upper right, uh, now in the Chrysler Museum. And uh, two works also came out of Durand Ruel's New York Galleries uh, by Claude Monet, Church of Orange V uh, from 1882, and now in the Columbus Museum of Art, and Field of Poppies from 1890 in the Smith College Museum collection. <clears throat> Untermeyer also shopped in Europe, as witnessed by a circa 1900 purchase of Eugène Delacroix's The Battle. Uh, it was sold Sotheby's London in 2009. And this came from a Munich dealer, uh, Julius Bowler. Bowler was also Untermeyer's source for several other works, including a portrait of Georgina Countess Spencer. And that's Georgina up there, supposedly a Gainsborough. He bought it as a Gainsborough, but it wasn't. Uh, um, also, the Feast of Echolus by Peter Paul Rubens and Jan Bruegel, the elder, now in the Metropolitan Museum of Arts collection. Um, both the Georgina and the Rubens Bruegel were purchased in 1910. Untermeyer continued to seek old master works, and as late as 1938, he bought St. Catherine of Alexandria, then given to the 17th century Italian Baroque painter Bernardo Cavallino, and now attributed to his workshop, also in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. In 1900, New York's Lotus Club, uh, thank you, Jay, for giving that introduction, uh, mounted an exhibition of 20 works from Untermeyer's collection. The mixture of American and European works, ranging, ranging from Innes, Whistler, Wyatt to, and Wyant to Millet, Delacroix, and Daubigny, prompted one reporter to observe that the selection, quote, also shows as an evidence that he understands American as well as foreign art. Four years later, in 1904, Untermeyer was a lender to the comparative exhibition of native and foreign art held in New York under the auspices of the Society of Art Collectors, about which I need to know more. Um, nearly 200 paintings, half of which were American and the other half European, and all executed over recent decades, were assembled for the purpose of demonstrating that native artists could equal the productions of their European counterparts. Untermeyer's role as patron and lender brought him into the same company as such, as such now more famous collectors as Charles Lang Freer and John Galatling, a circumstance that must have pleased him enormously. Moreover, Untermeyer's loans to the exhibition revealed the wide range of his collection, and as much as the five paintings from his collection were by Dombigny, Fromenton, Martin, Wyatt, and Whistler, thus presenting a strong contrast to the contributions from other collections that focused on relatively few artists, espoused distinct nationalist sentiment, or concentrated on particular aesthetic traits. Untermeyer's undine, undeniably Catholic taste was underscored in a 1916 article in Arts and Decoration featuring Greystone. And there are two pages from that article. Uh, it was written by uh, the American artist Guy Pen Dubois and illustrated by the American realist Jerome Myers. Um, it doesn't concentrate on the paintings in, in terms of the illustrations, but it, it shows you, I think, Myers' response to being in this huge 99-room mansion up in Yonkers and what do I draw to illustrate this article? Um, we have a, a sampling, though, with tapestries, Renaissance furniture, um, objet d'art, and uh, then some of the classical statuary that he had in his collection, and also the extent or the, the uh, implied extent of the gardens uh, in the illustration on the second page at the lower portion. 
Penn Du Bois elaborated on the sheer number and variety of objects that ranged in part from classical sculpture, carved oak, Renaissance furnishings, a German shrine, French Gothic tapestries, to, of course, the paintings. Apparently pressed to rationalize the eclectic assemblage, the artist writer concluded, the inside of the house is not a museum, though it contains in profusion objects that museums covet. Here, the taste, unrestricted by academic conceptions of collectorship, running an extravagant riot, becomes more pointedly evident. The collector, permitted to mix styles, to intertwine them, may express himself more fully." Close quote. The role of the realist painter Jerome Myers as the illustrator of the article is especially pertinent since Untermeyer owned three works by the artist. Myers' Madison Square concert, Summer Night, um, was in the collection by 1916, the year that the Arts and Decoration article was published. I don't have an image of that. First of all, if it's the painting I think it is, it's in the Addison um, Museum's collection, but it is so dark that it was pointless to try and reproduce him. The subject itself, however, likely appealed to Samuel and Minnie Untermeyer since their philanthropic activities included sponsoring public concerts. Moreover, Samuel Untermeyer may have felt a special affinity for Myers, who was a fellow Virginian. Arthur B. Davies, Builders of Temples, on the left, entered Untermeyer's collection in 1913, purchased from Macbeth Gallery. And I'm speculating here that the classical setting with the central group of dancing figures that is pretty hard to see, but let's see if I can get this pointer to work. There we go. Little group of dancers right there in the center. Um, the central group of dancing figures echoed the scenes first imagined and then created over the years in the gardens of the Greystone Estate that was so beloved by uh, Samuel and Minnie. Indeed, Isadora Dan Duncan's dance troupe reportedly performed there in 1923 and 1932. And you can just imagine the Duncan troop dancing in the Untermeyer Gardens. And I'm showing you a portion of the gardens as they are now um, on the right. And the two sphinxes that you can just see on the top of the columns uh, are, are works by Paul Manship that uh, Untermeyer uh, commissioned. Untermeyer's identity as a collector has been overshadowed, obviously, by his, his lauded and deserved, deservedly lauded career as a lawyer. Um, that, that deserves a book in and of itself. Um, also, the fact that Untermeyer Park and Gardens exists now in a revived state uh, doesn't really refer to his role as a collector. And this is all complicated, as I said earlier, by the fact that his collection was dispersed in 1940. A reasonable conclusion about his attitudes, however, stems from these facts. That is, he did not collect for posterity, but seems rather to have chosen and enjoyed works that struck a personal chord and simultaneously enhanced his reputation as a cultural leader. Now, in, in terms of, of striking a personal chord, if you just think back to the Baldini and the Chase. Very different artists, but they're both park scenes. And um, Untermeyer was, was so, so, uh, so keen to um, have his gardens, to design his gardens himself. And um, he, he once said, had he not been a lawyer, he wanted to be New York City's park commissioner. Um, his children, however, inherited his habits of collecting and philanthropy. And we can point to Judge Irwin Untermeyer's many gifts to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, 
some of which I suspect were originally owned by his father. For Manhattanites in particular, I hope that the Untermeyer Fountain, commissioned by Untermeyer from the German artist Walter Schott for the grounds of Greystone, and now located in the northern reaches of Central Park, will resonate with greater meaning. Thank you.